Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. And today I'm going to be talking about the governance of the United Kingdom and perhaps particularly the governance of England with two distinguished members of the Global Policy Institute, a sister organization of the Federal Trust. I'll be speaking today with Dr. Andrew Black and Professor Sam Wimster. Uh, greetings to you both. Um, Andrew will be talking about what he sees as being the, the deficiencies of the present system that we have within the United Kingdom, not just within the United Kingdom as a whole, uh, but perhaps more particularly with, within England. I think it's fair to say, Andrew, that uh, you favour a, a much more decentralised model of the United Kingdom and indeed of England, um, both for reasons of efficiency and reasons of, of democratic legitimacy. Can, can you tell us in five minutes or so what your reasoning is and what your experience is that has led you to these conclusions? Uh, yes, very, very briefly. I mean, uh, Sam and I have been working on something which we hope will turn into a book with a provisional title of Recasting the United Kingdom, Decentralising Governance, essentially. And I think one of the issues which has occurred to us or has become more obvious to us as we've been proceeding is that there are serious omissions and difficulties in the way in which the country at the moment is being governed and that this is causing difficulties uh, for the sort of continued survival of the United Kingdom as a political entity. I mean, it's difficult to know exactly where to start with this, so I'll, I'll be a bit discursive in a way, but consider, for example, the issue of devolution, which was really stumbled into, it seems to me, uh, back in the late 1990s by the new Labour government, which set up an arrangement with Scotland. There was another arrangement that was set up, a Good Friday Agreement with Northern Ireland. There's been yet another arrangement set up with Wales. And there are now additional sorts of semi-devolution arrangements, which are sort of being negotiated with various parts of England. Uh, and we would argue, I think, at the moment, that this is a rather incoherent way of proceeding. Uh, and if we're going to talk about the United Kingdom as a formal entity of itself, one would like to see, as is the case in most other countries that I can, we've been looking at, and particularly that is of a situation in Germany, that there is in fact one overarching uh, kind of constitutional arrangement which takes on board all different territorial parts of the country and treats them very much in the same way, just like all the states of America go have representation in the Senate and they're all abiding by the American constitution. Uh, the devolution arrangements in the United Kingdom, as far as we can see, are very much an ad hoc sort of an arrangement and essentially represent, we would argue, certain kinds of patronage, powers of patronage from the centre being doled out to the devolved nations. And uh, this has created an inequality in the governmental system in the United Kingdom, which has left the English regions bereft of any kind of formal political representation in our system. Um, and as Sam undoubtedly will, will, will reinforce some of these points, uh, the abolition of the House of, of all the ref reforms of the House of Lords back in 1911 has effectively created, as some people have argued, a parliamentary dictatorship in the House of Commons because the House of Commons has all the reserve powers and dispenses them as and when they see fit and they may be handed out or they may be withdrawn. And the trouble is, I think, that if you're looking at the situation at the moment, and this is not just a situation to do with the or the, uh, the Conservative Party. It, it, in a sense, it covers all the parties, and some of our, our analysis goes back to the beginning of the century, um, which shows really a remarkable absence of perception about how to represent regional interests and create, if you like, a median or middle tier of government, one of the better examples of which would be the, uh, the German lender. Uh, the German lender... Uh, there are 16 of them. They're all part of the German constitution. They have considerable powers in terms of funding, spending decisions. And so if we take something, for example, like HS2, which is a very current discussion at the moment, and listening to Andy Burnham, for example, uh, on the Today programme the other day, um, he is almost sort of going down on bended knee, begging because people in the central central government in Whitehall to listen to the regional interests. As many people have said, if the railway had been 
started in the north, there's no doubt it would have probably been finished. But because it started in the south, it's been sort of picked over and looked at, and there's no sort of coordinated way in which uh, the regional interests are being basically recognised. And I think what we also feel is this. We have a bicameral system uh, in this country, uh, there are other countries with bicameral systems. And if you look at them in more detail, you find that they have or the upper houses have more power, particularly in, for example, Australia, where the upper house the Senate, can, can, can shut down the entire government if it wants to. And I think what we've discovered or feel is, 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 is really missing is that in the House of Lords, as it's currently constituted, there is no regional representation whatsoever. Our preferences or our proposals, really, and these are, we're not the only people who've been saying something like this, would be to replace it with us, an upper chamber where the regions have specific interests, which are, they have a constitutional right to have, if you like, up to the last word on those particular subjects. And this would also be put together by a lender or by the regions, which would have a much greater sense of financial autonomy from the centre, they would control, have more control over tax revenues and what they do with them. They would also have more control over the spending which takes place in their regions. And that would mean that the central government would not necessarily be having to sort of get involved in sorting out the micromanagement of particular different issues. I mean, you know, for example, let's take water. The water supply situation in this country, it seems, is awful. If you look at other countries, and again, picking up the example of Germany, water supply issues are matters of the federal government and the lender, but the uh, the treatment of waste and sewage and all the rest of it, as you might imagine, is very much handed down to the local area of government. And uh, this system works, it seems to me, rather better than what we have uh, over here at the moment, where after privatisation uh, and the payment of many, many uh, millions of pounds, if not billions in the form of dividends and so on, we reach the extraordinary situation where a lot of our be beaches are not fit for swimming in and some of our water supplies are not fit to be drinking, be, 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 to be drunk either. Um, I think that's um, quite a good place to come to a pause, isn't it? Um, I think you... Yes. One last point you want to make? No, I just think that's that's fine. I, that's I fine. Think, we'll, yeah. we'll have the opportunity to come back to some mm. of those points. Sam, um, what are the constitutional remedies and responses uh, for the problems that, that Andrew so eloquently identified? Yes, the British Constitution... Um, as everybody points out, it's an unwritten constitution. And if you read an authority like, um, what do we have here? Principles of Local Government by a Mr. Jennings, a Professor Jennings of the, um, the Inns of Court. He just says, well, the British Constitution is everything since the Norman Conquest. It's just an accumulation of laws. And of course, if you try and look up these laws yourself. I mean, I recommend, for an example, looking up at the independence of the Bank of England from 1987. Sorry, when was it? 1997? Mm -hmm. um, yes, it, New Labour. It's a incredibly brief statement, which really doesn't say much, and you have no idea of the implications or the ramifications of it. So... The British are definitely in a problem uh, deciding what their constitution is. It's there. It's a consolidated mound of laws. Obviously, some of these are very important. House of Lords uh, ending the veto in 1911 is a very important one. Uh, the Reform Acts throughout the 19th century, starting in 1832, expansion of the franchise is very important too. And... Um, in terms of what Andrew's been speaking about, you'll find there have been a series of devolution deals, city deals, as they were first called, from 2012. Um, and these, when you look at them again, it's rather like the Bank of England. Uh, there are reserves powers and delegated powers, but it's not quite clear what's going on. The clarity is missing. Um, we don't have a gazette, uh, you know, a um, compendium of our laws 
Uh, so we, you can't look it up. Whereas, again, to use Andrew's example, in Germany, uh, the constitution is in one book, which is cheap to buy, and any citizen can look it up, as similarly is their, their law books. Um, whereas we have private and public law, which, again, is a huge accumulation. And, um, you know, you can make a professional living, as many do, interpreting this great mound of legislation. So we're in a bit of a fix here, seems to me. Um, and of course, the, the major constitutional change is the withdrawal from the European Union, which had devastating consequences for the way in which our state institutions operate. Um, the Withdrawal Act, uh, was agreed or rather prefigured in the European referendum, which was an advisory referendum. So there's, a, there's another clear example. You've got a vague formulation put forward by Messrs Osborne and Cameron. This is an advisory referendum. What are we going to do about our membership of the European Union? And then on the basis of not a super majority, but a 4% majority of those who voted, uh, everything changes. And Parliament, which is um, supreme in the making of legislation, that's the House of Commons, um, has then decide what to do. But Parliament is built on a representative principle and there's still elements of Edmund Burke in there that the MP should follow his conscience and use his intelligence on what he thinks is good and bad. And that still operates. I mean, we've got rid of um, three or four prime ministers simply on the basis of MPs following their intelligence and instincts. Um, so the British constitution in, in many ways is a mess. And if one's going to approach the devolution, decentralization, you've got to find a means of doing it. And it's not at all clear how one would do that. You can do anything you want. AJP Taylor, the famous historian, perhaps he's not so famous now, but he was when I was at school. Um, he said, the British constitution is whatever the uh, politicians can get away with in this country. Um, I think a more useful approach would be to say, well, what's, you know, if you think about the term constitution, we, we, we use it in this formal legalistic sense to refer to our laws and how they are made, and also the division relationship between the organs or the institutions of the state that is to say, the civil service, the executive, and the judiciary. Um, we use it in that formal way, and that's how everybody tends to think about it, and everybody's brain tends to grind to a halt uh, because nobody quite knows how these things operate. But if you think about the wider term of constitution, we talk about how a society is constituted, right? So I'm wearing my sociologist's hat now. Um, we could talk about uh, the way in which society is constituted. Um, sociologists do this all the time. They talk about networks, they talk about markets, they talk about classes, and there is a, an organisation to it which we could call the social constitution. And all our institutions, like local government, are constituted in, in a certain way. So I think the trick is to say, well, look, given the nature of our society, um, which is one that's going its own way. I mean, people are not enthusiastic about being governed. The British never were. Um, uh, you know, the old cartoons from Gilray. Uh, the British people have always known what's good for them and uh, government better oblige us, otherwise we'll uh, throw crockery into the streets and stamp our feet. 
But that's um, not, not happening, Sam, is it? No. There's an extraordinary apathy uh, among the population. The mm. constitutional issues that you're talking about have surprisingly little resonance with the mm. British electorate. Um, mm. Why do you think that is? Well, could I come in here for a moment? Yes, by, all means, by all means, give Sam time to think about the answer to the question. Well, we've been doing some work um, on, if you like, the fiscal side of things, which... Uh, uh, which is part of the sort of if you like the the financial fiscal economic glue which which holds the country together and what has been going on in terms glue of or gloom glue <laughs> well or both gloom. at the moment, oh, at the moment. <laughs> yeah. but uh, and and this this was quite a, kind of interesting because i think what we've picked up on is it's a complete dearth of information about really really uh, about the, the what's going on at the regional level in England, uh, and uh, the state of the sort of statistics, if you like, uh, of, of regional statistics, which include the devolved nations. Sometimes they don't include the devolved nations. It's sometimes surprisingly difficult, although we talk about the United Kingdom, for example, to get a clear picture of what's going on in the United Kingdom, because a lot of the statistics are only on for a part of it. So you have England, you have England and Wales, you have England, Wales and Scotland, and then you have Northern Ireland tagged on at the end. And of course, there are considerable differences in some ways that's going on here. But it's the work which we've been doing. It, it looks very much that, uh, unlike, say, in Germany, where you have local taxes raised and controlled by the regions, um, in Britain there is they have recorded what taxes have raised, but these taxes don't actually belong in any sense to the regions. They go straight to Whitehall and then get redistributed. We're looking at um, how the uh, the system actually functioned and worked. And we have a system at the moment which is really sort of drawn up by uh, or funded, if you like, by surpluses, fiscal surpluses, which are um, uh, taking place. Uh, and uh, there are surpluses in places like London, uh, the East and the Southeast. And all the other regions basically run fiscal deficits with the central government. And one of the recent victims of this has been Birmingham. Birmingham uh, has declared itself more or less bankrupt and uh, is therefore trying to, uh, is now in the hands of, if you like, the receivers to try and work out what's going on. Uh, we would argue that this is very much something which could probably have been avoided if one had used a more regional uh, approach to, uh, to, 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 to the government. Sam, do you want to add anything to that um Andrew's view that because people often don't have access to the information, that's why they're not as uh, aware of the problems as they might be. Well, <clears throat> democracy, and we're talking about, you know, the people stamping their feet, exercising their democratic rights, let's put it like that. It's advanced from the 18th century. We have democratic rights. But in fact, at the local level, these are extremely limited. And if you go back to the great Alexis de Tocqueville when he travelled America, he said democracy works because it doesn't matter what level you are, the township, uh, the county, the state, uh, there are democratic institutions with, it, with which people can participate. So, again, using a sociological analysis, um, Durkheim referred to the lack of social bonds, the lack of participative energy to equal that anime. So you've got a situation where local government, regional representation is being denied to most of the population. And again, this was articulated by Andy Burnham these last few days when it was announced that the HS2 may no longer go to Manchester. Um, and it's almost as if the north of England has been cut off just as was the channel has cut off the continent from us. So we're in this ridiculous situation of heartland. It's sort of, you know, Britain, the United Kingdom, is almost reduced to a rump of, of what was historically called Wessex, uh, which is the sort of heartland England. And uh, they do quite well, but there's been a sort of withering away of um, local government, uh, really in the last half of the 20th century. 
Whereas if you go back to the 19th century, the central state, what did it do? It did defense and uh, it did foreign policy. Everything else was local government. And slowly the central government has imposed its will from the center and right hall. And the extraordinary thing in terms of constitutional history is that the Thatcher government from about 1981 to 1985 abolished five metropolitan councils and took away enormous powers from county councils and town councils. And I, ca I can't understand looking back at it, how that could have happened. How can you have uh, the institutions of local government, which were there in law, suddenly changed? And well, is, is it reversible? Is it reversible, Sam? Yes, of course it's reversible. The House By of Commons. Whom? By whom? Uh, Was there a political the majority Commons. for it? The House of Commons is supreme in what we call the British Constitution, right? There's no other institution that has any power over it apart from the Supreme Court, which can uh, rule on the validity of the laws already made by the House of Commons and whether the executive is, in fact, following those laws. Um, so it seems to me that we've got to put the infrastructure back of local government rights, local, I mean, local government as government. Yeah. So if you scale that up, we, we're sort of getting there with the uh, combined metropolitan authorities. Uh, Andy Burnham and Andy Street were quite eloquent about this on a recent podcast, Rest is Politics. And they're creating a, a bureaucracy, a cabinet. So they're putting back what was there before. And Andy okay. Burnham, you will remember, Brendan, uh, from one of your previous video Zoom calls, um, said what we've got in terms of combined metropolitan authorities still doesn't approach what local governments had before 1981. Yeah. Can you see any political combination, a, a coalition of parties that's willing to use these powers, which Sam rightly says are vested in the House of Commons, um, to restore the position before 1981, and particularly to do it on a, on a universal scale. I can see there might be willingness to do it for individual metropolitan authorities, but it is a radical, coherent um, programme of reform um, on the cards in the political conjunction that we have at the moment? I must admit, I find it very difficult to see where that's coming from. I mean, it was the commission, uh, Gordon Brown's commission, that was, uh, I think, uh, authorised by, by Starmer uh, to look at the future of England and constitutional, constitutional arrangements were included in that. Uh, it received some sort of attention at the time, and since then, the public attention has moved on somewhere else. I can't really see it quite like that. I mean, going back to Andy Burnham and Manchester and all the rest of it, I agree with him entirely. Uh, that it's not right what we've got at the moment. And as I was saying earlier, one of the key things here are the financial linkages, if you like, which essentially emanate from the Treasury, HMT, through the House of Commons. But the House of Commons has often given, if you like, a carte blanche to go out and do various kinds of spending and programmes and all the rest of it, for example, under the terms of the Industri Industry Act of 1973, which don't actually require any further oversight from the House of Commons. It's almost not exactly an automatic pilot, but the civil servants and other people can make those decisions about how much money to get and how it's going to be spent and all the rest of it. The local uh, the local authorities or, and, and the idea of a regional authority, which doesn't currently exist, uh, would, if we were to copy other countries in that respect, give them much more independence, fiscal independence if you like, from London, from the centre. And I think that this aspect of it hasn't really been mentioned or hasn't been stressed enough. And maybe for many people, uh, the connections are too far apart. But I see them as being absolutely integral. And therefore, this brings us right back to the question of the House of Lords and having that or, or the upper house, which represents the interests of the uh, regions, all of the regions. And I think that uh, 
what needs to be seen in England, at least, because I think the, the case, if you like, is to some extent being won in Scotland and won in Northern Ireland and to some extent in Wales as well. I think that those devolved nations are gaining some benefit from a, a more decentralised system. And I think the, the English regions, I think, uh, should be start. Well, people who are interested in reform think that, we, that regions uh, in England in particular could be instituted, developed, and given then their space and their power, which necessarily would mean taking power away from the centre. Sam, and I think, Sam yeah. do you agree with that? Do, do you think that uh, a regionalised House of Lords would be a good idea? Well, well the, the crucial question is how to get there. Uh, because, I mean, let's come back to democracy. Democracy is you, the, the crucial thing that it's operating yeah, it's not necessarily an endpoint in itself. It's a process that has to reflect the changes in society, changes in interests. And there is this uh, underlying idea that, that democracy belongs to the people, the franchise as a whole. Um, now, to get there, you have to have a political m movement. OK, Gordon Brown's certainly done good work on this. He's written a book on home rule, which is an interesting concept, but a bit of a historical fossil for those who aren't up on their uh, Gladstone and uh, the like. Um, but to come back to the metropolitan mayors, that's quite an interesting development because these are political figures now in their own right, some of them. And that gives a basis for political mobilization. So, I mean, Mr. Starmer at the centre in the Labour Party that seems to be configured around about six people, bunkered down somewhere in in uh, wherever they have their headquarters, whereas you have the mayors speaking out very freely on what are their issues. You know, they haven't got control of their transport, their trains. They've only just put in a bus system in Greater Manchester. It's unbelievable. Whereas here in London, Livingstone put in a, a bus system overnight and it was a huge change. Suddenly you could get a bus. One would come along all the time. Um, <laughs> you know, the old joke was rendered yeah. <laughs> void. <laughs> um, so I think it's, it's the metropolitan mayors who need to make the running on this one and stand up for regional powers, which at the moment are configured around the, the, the large metropolitan conurbations. But they're not going to be able to ignore their urban hinterland. So you think, that, that, Andrew, do you agree that... Ad Sorry, they're, they're, ru they're rural hinterland. Yeah. I misspoke. Yeah. Sorry. No, no yeah. do, do, do you think that these ad hoc arrangements and... Uh, for metropolitan areas are the best that can be envisaged in the foreseeable future? Well, we've, Sam and I have been kicking a few ideas around on this, and no, I don't think that, I don't think that is adequate. I mean, uh, we're trying to sort of, it's a dreadful thing, trying to sort of forecast the future, isn't it? Mm. Um, but I think as things are developing at the moment, it strikes strikes me at least as it's too chaotic and there are too many contradictions in the system as I say, coming back to this fiscal material, we find out that there are huge inequalities in the way in which government money is spent across on a regional basis. There's no justification for that that we can see in any constitutional measure whatsoever. It's just a product of a system which is essentially being directed from uh, from London uh, as to what do we have to do to keep people sort of at a minimum happy. And there are biases in the system. And very often, as we see again with the rail, rail example, the long-term interest is frequently shelved for short-term political interests. And I think this raises a very important question about how to get there, because there has to be a recognition, I think, a broad recognition in the public and amongst the voters that what we're getting at the moment is inadequate to serve the interests of the country in the longer term. And one of the reasons for that is because the basis of the, the way in which the opinions are being formed in the House of Commons is too narrow, too unrepresentative, given the electoral system, uh, and therefore something has fundamentally got to change. After all, I don't know of any other country where you have a first-past-the-post system in one part of the government and proportional representation in other parts of it. I mean, we can't even agree to get a single electoral system 
system worked out across the whole of the United Kingdom. And it seems to me that if those sorts of very basic things cannot be resolved, then it makes me wonder how far the country can continue to call itself the United Kingdom before bits start to fall off. And we've already seen in the SNP and some of the, and the Sinn Féin and so on, there are organized political forces in this country or the United Kingdom who do not want to stay in the United Kingdom. Now, this is, if you look across the European map, at least, is, is relatively unusual. One or two of the other countries have got a, sort of a, a, a province or two that aren't very happy, but I don't think that they've decided they actually want to leave uh, the existing political entity. But that is the circumstances that we're faced with here. And so if nothing is done to resolve that situation, I think the friction is going to grow. The unrest is going to grow. Uh, whether the, and, and at some point or other, there's going to be a, a really significant crisis, I would say. I'm not My sure final when. question to both of you. Uh, would a, a written constitution um, help solve these problems? Uh, Sam, do you think are you in favour of a written constitution? What do you think its beneficial effects would be? I think you have to be a republic to mm. have a written constitution because uh, it's a foundational document and republics are founded... Uh, you know, it's kind of a singularity. We don't have that. Our constitution is run from the Norman Conquest 1066 onwards. And we have the advantage, certainly over the United States as we speak, um, is that we don't have to go back to an original constitution. Our constitution changes all the time. It has flexibility. And you will find that the new intake of MPs for 2024 is slated to have a lot of local councillors coming in as MPs. And you'll look at the local government association. They are stamping their feet quite publicly and demanding far more delegated powers so they can get back to what they were doing and have some time horizon, some fiscal certainty to uh, put back the delivery of services because it's local government that does this and they've really got to also mobilize and um, get things moving and they can force that through the house of commons that's how it's done Very could I, could, could Andrew, sort of, do you agree yes. with that yeah basically i do but i think what i would say is that doing it at a very local level is still going to make it very easy for a divide and rule type of policy coming from the centre from the House of Commons. That's why I think that we need to have this middle layer with the regions represented and the regions having in that sense the last word on certain issues or legislative issues which affect the rights of the regions. And this is something which happens in Germany with the Bundesrat. And this is an important point where all the regional interests can come together and seek out those points that they all have in common. And if necessary, turn around to the House of Commons and say, no, that's not in our interest. We're not going to do it that way. Chuck it out and we'll try again and find another way through. That, Unless we have something of a break, if you like, at that level, uh, I would say that on uh, handing more power back to the local authorities, there's a huge danger that they will simply be played off against each other, and which is basically, in a sense, what's happening uh, insofar as they have any particular autonomy left at all. Thank you very much indeed. We'll look out to see what happens after 2024. It may, may be, of course, that um, when these local politicians go to Westminster, they suddenly decide that Westminster ought to have all the power because they are the people who are <laughs> carrying it out. Um, Very likely, yeah. Situations can can alter perspective, as they say. Yeah. But we'll have the opportunity to talk about that many times over the coming months and years. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, Thank I hope you very much. Viewers and listeners have, have enjoyed this discussion. I certainly have. Thank, Thank you. you.